so um, I am very excited to introduce our um, two speakers. So I will briefly run through their bios and then um, hand it over to Ellen. Uh, so first, Gail Golden is a state senator from Rhode Island, uh, who as a newly elected legislator championed the passage of temporary caregiver insurance, making Rhode Island the third state in the country to create paid family leave and the first to do so with job protection. And she's a consultant in the nonprofit sector, graduated from McGill University, and earned her master's in public policy from Tufts University. So thank you so much for being with us. Happy to be here. And Ellen Bravo is a lifelong activist for working women uh, who has spent more than two decades at 9 to 5 National Association of Working Women and served as its national director until 2004. Right now, she is the executive director for Family Values at Work, a network of state coalitions that has worked for paid sick days and paid family leave. She has an incredible wealth of experience with her um, ha having served on a number of state and federal commissions, including the Bipartisan Commission on Leave, and her novel on date rape and politics will be published this August. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. We're so proud to be working with Emerge, what great work you do, and really happy that you're doing this webinar. So I want to just give you a little background on how we got in the position we're in and what is that position. Um, it, it started you know, we actually have a history in this country that many people don't know, that there are five states, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, California, Hawaii, and also Puerto Rico, that set up temporary disability insurance funds. And if you could see the slide, you would see that it says, um, or are they seeing it and I'm not, just tell me. They were explicitly written to, pro, to pro, leave out pregnancy. New Jersey had a famous sentence that, lumped pregnancy with injuries that were willfully self-inflicted or incurred during the perpetration of a high misdemeanor. Oh, good. Okay. So go to the next slide and the next. Um, until 19, you know, you know that it was perfectly legal to fire someone who was pregnant. There was finally a case that went to the Supreme Court and in their wisdom, the justices said that it is not discriminatory to treat pregnant people differently because not all women are pregnant and therefore it's not gender discrimination, not covered by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Next slide, please. You may think that Congress doesn't know a lot, but they did get that sex and pregnancy have something to do with each other. And so in 1978, thanks to a huge coalition, by the way, they passed the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. And here's what it says, it says, you can't treat pregnant women differently, but you can treat all employees badly. So if you have a temporary disability insurance policy at work, you have to treat pregnancy the same as you would a heart attack or a broken leg. But most women work for firms that don't have short-term disability. And while the Pregnancy Discrimination Act says you can't fire someone for being pregnant, it does not require that you hold their job open. I've never understood this distinction. Next slide, please. Here's what happened. That's why we worked hard to pass the Family and Medical Leave Act, the FMLA, in 1993. I'm sure you know it took nine years to pass it. And what it provides is 12 weeks to care for a new baby or a seriously ill child or parent or partner or yourself. Um, it does include a job guarantee, unlike the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and continuation of health insurance. In, and it applies to men as well as women. It recognizes that it's not just mothers, but fathers who have new children, and that it's not just new babies who need care. Next slide, please. And here's, however, what's wrong with the FMLA. 40% uh, of the workforce is not covered. It has a very narrow definition of family. So siblings, for example, aren't family. Domestic partners, unmarried same-sex couples, for example, are not covered. It does not cover routine illness. Thank God all kids don't get leukemia, but they all get ear infections and strep throat. That's not covered. And of course, the biggest problem is it's unpaid. Go on, please. The next slide. And so uh, I, I made this for you to do a quick look at what countries you think don't offer paid leave. Whenever I do this, people will yell out Bangladesh and Cameroon and Mongolia. Next slide, please. But it turns out that Bangladesh and Cameroon have 100% paid. Only the United States and Papua New Guinea 
have no paid leave. Even Mongolia, 17 weeks at 70% pay. Next slide, please. And basically what the opponents of change say to us, they really speak out of both sides of their mouth. Because on the one hand, they talk family values. They talk about the importance of children as in our future and the importance of seniors. Uh, we, we on a motherhood, and yet when we say, well, let's make leave affordable so that people can be good family members, they say the sky will fall and it will destroy jobs. Next slide, please. Here's what we say. This is the framing that we found to be useful, that if you're going to be a good parent or a good child to your parents, that should not jeopardize your financial security. And next slide. We, we know, fortunately, that a family medical leave insurance fund is a cost-effective way to make leave affordable and there's a we have the goods on this there's a growing body of evidence that shows that it's good for families good for business and good for the economy we know it from the experience of every other country but us in papua new guinea but now we also know it from three states in the u.s that have set up these funds and i'm going to pass it over to gail thanks so much so thank you. Uh, I, I also want to thank um, Emerge for uh, hosting this event today and uh, mention that my uh, colleague in state government, Arizona, Katie Hobbs, and I have um, talked about paid family leave a lot. And so I'm excited to be able to um, discuss this with uh, the broader Emerge community. Um, so as Ellen says, there's you know this history of family leave in our of, of temporary disability in our country through um, the states that have temporary disability insurance. And over the past um, uh, 12, 14 years or so, uh, we have seen a change in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. And what these three states did was it, taking their existing temporary disability insurance program and it added on that family leave so that you could take time off to bond with a new child uh, through birth, adoption, or foster care and that you could um, take time off to care for somebody else who was seriously ill. Um, there are some slight differences in the way that California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island do their uh, programs. Um, the two most significant ones are certainly for bonding on foster care, which I believe only Rhode Island and California have. Um, and then the uh, job protection in Rhode Island is pretty, uh, is the only, we're the only state in the country that has job protection. And that is uh, critically important uh, for workers so that they know that they can return to their job after they're able to take this time off. Um, I also want to note that while Rhode Island has four weeks and California and New Jersey have six weeks of this separate family leave insurance program, they are built off an existing temporary disability insurance program, which as Ellen said, um, did get added, pregnancy did get added in in the late 70s because of federal law. And so that does mean in uh, the states with temporary disability insurance, you do get um, leave, paid leave, based on the disability associated with the uh, pregnancy and the childbirth. And so what that means in reality for somebody in Rhode Island is if you need to be on, uh, for a pregnant woman needs to be on bed rest, she's able to take temporary disability insurance to be on bed rest. Um, and then she has six to eight weeks of time that's paid through the temporary disability insurance program um, that's associated with the childbirth. And then she may take the time to bond with her newborn child as well as uh, the other parent in the family can take that time off as, as well. Next slide. So as you'll see, this has been a pretty amazing breakout year for paid family leave. Um, states around the country have introduced different uh, legislative uh, packages to try and address paid family leave. Um, there have been uh, ones that range from Democrats and Republicans, uh, so it's across the political spectrum. And the first three in this category list right here shows um, that the strongest programs are building off of the insurance, like temporary disability insurance in the five states that have it. Um, you know, we've seen uh, so basically they would create a base level of temporary disability insurance for the individual and then also built on the paid family leave um, component that is for caring for somebody else or bonding with a new child. And you can see the different states that have that. 
one of the key decisions in doing that is who's going to pay for it. Uh, in Rhode Island, we have it paid for solely by employees, as does California. New Jersey's temporary disability insurance program is paid for um, partially by employers and employees, but the paid family leave part is solely paid for by employees. So part of that is um, about the political decisions you have to make in order to make this program viable, and part of it is about um, who's who's advocating for it. But ultimately, um, it, there's there's a cost associated with it. You have to figure out how it's going to get paid for. Um, so there are a couple of states who have tried to tackle that through general revenue models. Um, and, you know, there are some pluses and minuses to that. Um, certainly the big minus is that if you have a state that doesn't have general revenues available to do that, it's not a viable um, possibility. And, of course, there are the political implications of, you know, maybe you can get the general revenues in this year. Can you get it in and the next um, governor or shift with the General Assembly? So those are really some things to think about um, in, as you look at the kind of models that are out there. And then the next three, employer requirement tax credit and savings accounts. On the surface, they all kind of sound like they could be good ideas, but the reality is they have some serious issues associated with them. Uh, Michigan, while it would be great to create parental leave, um, if you're creating it for just a certain category of employees, and when you're talking about lar larger em employers, that's probably, you know, only 40 to 50 percent of the workforce, um, depending on the state. And so you really need to think about, okay, we're only addressing part of the issue, and we're only doing it for part of the um, the economy, and that in itself is problematic. The tax credits, you know, this is a way that essentially um, states can create incentives for businesses to create paid leave of some type, but the reality is um, this may just mean that businesses who are already providing paid leave or were going to do it anyway are going to benefit from a tax credit, and, uh, and your state should really think about whether or not that's a tax credit uh, that makes sense. Um, and most likely it won't uh, create any additional paid leave in the state. And then savings accounts, um, of course, encouraging people to save is, um, is a good idea, but it only works if you have the extra cash to be able to save it. And the reality is uh, for the majority of low to modest wage er earners, this just isn't something that they would be able to do. And yet they're the people who have least access to paid time off, either through sick days or paid family leave or vacation days, even to be able to deal with um, a family emergency. And so then we can see that there are also states that have put together tax for task forces or are doing study commissions in some way. And um, hopefully we'll also lay the foundation for their ability to apply for paid leave grants from the U.S. Department of Labor. Next slide. So I just want to point out that the, um, this set of the, this portion of our slides, we did jointly with three other groups, A Better Balance, the Institute for Women's Policy Research and National Partnership for Women and Families. There are terrific resources, uh, A Better Balance and National Partnership to help write, draft the bills, IWPR for research and background information. And we'll make sure that you get all the contact information for those groups as well as for us. These are some key features, though, that we really encourage any bill that you write to include. First of all, it has to cover all workers. As Gail was saying, uh, programs like tax credits, part of the problem with them is that they can never co cover everyone, and they really leave out um, the people who need it the most, who have the least access to affordable leave. We want to make sure that you don't pay into a program if you, if you built a program that was true only for employers of a certain size, today I work at Walmart, tomorrow I work at my friend's fabric shop, I've paid into the program and now I need it and I can't draw from it because my employer is too small. So we don't want to put anybody in that situation. Everybody should participate. That's what an insurance pool is. Lots of people making small contributions creates a big enough pool that we can draw a significant portion of income when we need it. Clearly, it needs to be gender neutral, as we were saying. We want to make sure that it covers all reasons people need leave so that we can care for parents and partners and sick family members in our own illness. And that's one of the things that keeps it from being discriminatory, used against women, because men need all of those kinds of leads too. 
and even people who aren't parents have parents or have a partner or themselves may fall ill. It's easier for them to see the stake they have in it. We want to find ways to calibrate the benefits so that those, <coughs> I'm sorry, to get maximum uptake by the lowest wage people, if they can get a larger percentage of their income while they're out, they're more likely to use it. And so we're trying new ways of designing these programs to give a bigger percentage of pay to those who have the least. And we're also trying to think about, is there a way to maybe exempt a first 10,000, say, of income and have the contributions be based on a larger wage past the Social Security base to make up for that? There are some interesting ideas. We want to make sure that the people can return to work so just to clarify, in California and New Jersey, people who are already covered by, their, by the FMLA have job protection, but everyone is covered by the state paid family leave insurance fund. And if you're not covered by FMLA, or if it's a purpose that's not covered by the federal FMLA, like let's say caring for a sibling, you can take the leave, you can draw the income, but you may not have a job to get back to. And so Rhode Island saying job protecting for every leave taker was a big step forward and we hope it will set the new bottom line. Uh, there has to be a funding mechanism if you don't have a temporary disability insurance fund in your state to set, uh, figure out how you're gonna pay for the startup costs. And a number of the programs that are being drafted right now and the campaigns that our states are waging, have it be that you pay, people pay in and the program starts later so that there's enough money accumulated if there isn't another way of generating those startup costs. I'll talk more about in a minute, a way for the federal government to do it, but politically that may not happen right now. Um, obviously, if there's an existing law, you want to build on it if it's possible and stay true to their principles. But, and, um, but if you, you don't want to supplant existing paid leave programs that employers have or through collective bargaining. Our goal always is to advantage, not disadvantage, those who have done more. Next slide, please. I'm turning it back to you, Gail. Uh, so as you can see from the slide, you know, building off of what Ellen just said, um, part of the reality is as you move forward in this work, you have to make some key decisions. And there are often moments as you're developing um, public policy where you have to decide what is um, the most important for your state and your constituencies and your, co your coalition as you're working together on this. Um, and how are you gonna go forward with that? Um, you have to think about the eligibility rules and you know, who's going to be paying for it, how long the leave is going to be. Um, if you're going to have a benefit structure, you know, Ellen sort of touched on this in Colorado, the legislation that they have um, put in this year would mean that lower wage earners would actually get more pay back for every week. Um, unlike in the states that currently have the program, um, everybody gets the same percentage of their wages. Uh, and the reality is if you are a minimum wage worker, only getting 60% of your wages may make it impossible for you to be able to take that leave. And certainly if you're paying for it, you should be able to be to take that leave. So those are one of the um, key questions to think about. Um, as you know, Ellen had mentioned about the job protection language, um, I think that's critically important. It's one of the things that as a state senator, I was most strongly uh, ensured that we kept in there to the very end. And you may notice that Rhode Island has only four weeks where California and New Jersey have six weeks. Um, part of that was to ensure that that job protection language stayed in there um, and to show that it, with four weeks, people could take some time off and return to their job and it would not negatively affect their businesses, but more likely, uh, possibly, that have a positive effect on their employers as well as their own family. And once we'd be able to build on that, be able to grow out the leave and increase the amount of weeks uh, that could be available for using in that time. And then, you know, certainly figuring out what the benefit really should look like, how much wage, is it gonna be 100%, is it gonna be 50%, you know, what amount are you gonna have back? And then who is gonna be 
um, the administrative administrative agents that you use in order to get this leave done in your state. Next slide. So we're happy to share, I'm sure you know, that the United States Department of Labor has this year made a million, one and a quarter million dollars available for competitive grants for states. They had a webinar earlier today. There's lots of information we can help you get um, if you're thinking about applying and we're not able to be on that webinar. There's also money in the budget for, as proposed by the president that would give much more money to the states. $35 million is in his proposed budget from money that is accounted for, and then an additional $2.2 billion in what he called the uh, initiatives fund. Unfortunately, in this political climate, it's unlikely that those are going to go anywhere, but it would be great, as those, especially those of you who are state legislators, for you to contact your federal elected officials and tell them why this is so important for your state, how this could make the difference between getting it off the ground and um, you know, uh, weighing in on the need. And likewise, to weigh into the Department of Labor, even if you don't apply, to thank them and applaud them for making these grants available. Next slide, please. Um, here are some of the resources that are available. Um, on sample bills by Better Balance and National Partnership, on the research studies from IWPR, a database of what various states are doing, um, and we're happy to help you get in touch with people um, to, you know, to get this work going. I'm going to turn it back to Gail to talk about what you can do as elected officials and as supporters, and then obviously we're going to open it up for questions from all of you. Thanks so much. Thanks, and you can, uh, if you want to type in questions right now through um, the, the question and the answers, um, you know, feel free to, to get those questions out there as we're, as we're talking and type those in. So what can you do as elected leaders? Um, you know, there are, in Family Values at Work, um, has 21 state coalitions around the country that are working on paid leave policies. And if you are an elected leader in one of those states, you should absolutely reach out to them find out what they're doing, where they're going with their work, um, and see how you can help and uh, see what, what leadership you can lend to them and what doors you can help open for them. Um, obviously, that means there are states where there isn't a Family Values at Work funding coalition, and there may not be a specific uh, group that's already set up that's working on paid family leave. Um, you know, that was the case in Rhode Island when I started my advocacy for creating paid family leave. I went out and I um, talked to a whole group of people uh, of organizations and said, you know, this is critically important. This has been my life experience and I know it's important, so I know it must be important for the rest of Rhode Island and um, it helped start the conversation, which then led to the creation of coalition and more people working together on this particular issue. So you absolutely can be, um, you can start the, that conversation and, you know, I would start it by going to organizations that care about um, issues that are similar to things that are like paid family leave. So I would approach AARP and um, child advocacy or parent organizations. I would go to labor unions, now chapters, the March of Dimes, um, looking at disability organizations, commissions on women's workers' rights groups. Uh, if there's women's funds in your community, I would approach them and uh, and any other uh, women's political engagement organization. And importantly, I would go to businesses. You will find that there are certainly um, businesses in your state that offer paid leave right now. And there are also small businesses who wish that they could offer paid leave, but just don't have the capacity to do it for their 5, 10, 15, 20 employees, but realize that this would give them the competitive edge if something existed in their state and or at least give them the level playing field to larger employers. So use the relationships that you have now, um, connect with them and see what's going on. Um, I would also 
realize that this is a very popular issue across the political spectrum. Um, so that means that you might have unlikely partners as an elected official who might like to help you get this done. Um, talk to your colleagues and try and build on the momentum that's happening nationally for paid family leave. I would create and find opportunities to talk about paid family leave from a public discussion uh, standpoint. I would write op-eds. I would leave talking about the need for paid family leave into your uh, public speaking remarks at other, other events that might touch on the need for working families to have better policies. I would um, create forums. Uh, one of the things that was done in Rhode Island uh, as we were working on passing our paid family leave bill is um, the Women's Fund of Rhode Island and the coalition uh, brought in Premier uh, Madeline Coonan to talk about her book, The New Feminist Agenda. And in a room filled with um, about 100 women and our highest elected uh, leaders who are women in the state, um, talked about why paid family leave was not only necessary, but how it could get done in Rhode Island. And that really helped um, continue the momentum and build a larger conversation with a larger group of people. Uh, so I would also use social media. I mean, the following family values at work, following me, following National Partnership, uh, Moms Rising. Many of these organizations are constantly tweeting or face posting on Facebook about um, paid family leave. Continue building on that public momentum. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you are running for office, this is a great campaign platform. Uh, people care about paid leave, they understand it, and they think it should happen. Uh, so definitely use that as a campaign platform. Next slide. Um, so supporters, uh, absolutely. If you, you know, there are many things that supporters can do, certainly. If you uh, have a coalition in your state or groups that are already working on it, get involved with them. But one of the things that I think is really key is sharing your stories. And that is because it is very hard for uh, elected officials, um, for the public in general to walk away from a parent talking about why they needed time off to care for their dying child who's in hospice. Um, and not every story is as significant or as heartbreaking as that, but it really resonates with people when you share your story, even if it's just like Michelle Wu talking about needing to be able to take that time off um, when she had a newborn child in her home. Uh, it makes sense. It resonates with people. They get it, and you should talk about it and share those stories. Uh, bring in the people that you know, much like being an elected official, you, you have networks as well, and Every one of those networks is a potential ally in getting this legislation passed. Uh, use your voices and connect with your elected officials. If you wanna see some bills going in your state, you should absolutely reach out to elected officials that are likely to um, be interested in such a topic because they've been interested in other legislation or you know that have had a life experience that leads them to support paid family leave. Um, you also can certainly reach out to um, state level and municipal uh, leaders like council members and mayors and governors and ask for them to take action for their own employees. Even if they can't do it for everybody in the state, um, having uh, council members like in Boston with the mayor take the lead and say, we're gonna create parental leave uh, for our employees sets a precedent for the rest of the state. And of course you wanna set up in district meetings with legislators and support the grassroots organizations that are working on paid leave or other policies that build around paid leave, like childcare in particular, um, because those are the people who are most connected into the communities that need that assistance and can um, go back to sharing their stories with others. Next slide. So this is our contact information. Um, Ellen and I can both get you in contact with any of the Family Values at Work coalitions. If you certainly, uh, in a state, if you are interested in working with them, um, you can go to the Family Values at Work website and they list all of the states with the contact information. Um, and we can also connect you with other organizations that work on this policy on a national level. And you can reach us in all these different ways.
Ellen? Yeah, we're eager to hear your questions. Great, thank you very much, Maya, and thank you so much to Ellen and Gail for, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, some of the questions have been touched on already. Um, I will just summarize the, the first question that we received about California, a state that uh, in our efforts in Boston, we, we look to as an example, uh, because California has not only had a pro paid parental leave program in place uh, for a while, but also has produced a lot of research that, that demonstrates exactly as Gail was saying, that it, it ends up uh, being a net positive for employers rather than uh, pure cost. However, just a footnote to that from one of our participants, Amy had said, um, FYI, the California program excludes public employees because they don't already participate in that particular insurance program. And that based on the assumption that as public employees, you would be unionized and can bargain for that benefit. Uh, in fact, only about 30% of public employees are unionized and may not know how or have been able to bargain for it. Um, so what should Californians do? Um, Amy has been in touch with a legislator and encourages everybody from her state to contact their Assembly and Senate members. Uh, Gail had shared a, a couple other steps about telling your story and, and um, getting people uh, personalizing the, the need and, and the reasons why paid parental leave is, is so important. Um, any other thoughts from our panelists? Um, when there is a program in place that doesn't include everyone, how do you continue to expand it? How do you continue to push for uh, the, the rest of those loopholes to be closed or for the, the amount of time to be ex extended? Um. I'll start and then Gail, see if you want to add the, the one of the basic uh, reasons we founded Family Values at Work was to help raise money and share it with groups on the ground. And not just for one or two immediate short term bills, but for the long haul and for systemic change. And so our view is we're always about seeing how we can improve and engage people who are impacted to be the agents of that change. And so in this case, you know, or obviously we urge you to both involve, as you are, um, other people in California, the, the public sector unions, the other people who represent public sector employees, any associations that they have, any ways that you can get them involved. And, um, and then the Work and Family Coalition there, I'm sure would be really proud to be part of that. One of the things that's so important about our work is making visible, you know, people talk a lot about what does it cost to do this? What we make visible is the cost of not doing it to families, to the economy, and, you know, to everything that we say we hold dear as a nation. And so being able to say, yes, I'm a public employee, but I don't have access to these benefits. And this is what it meant when fill in the blank, I had a new baby, my dad was dying, my kid had cancer. and um, that's really what helps change things. So I appreciate you bringing that up as an example of a bigger principle of engaging those who are most affected and getting our partners and always understanding that there's room for improvement. Any additional thoughts, Gail? Uh, so it's the same thing in Rhode Island, and that is because these these programs are built off of um, a program. You know, in Rhode Island, we were the first in the nation with temporary disability insurance, which was created in 1942. And certainly at the time, I, I'm sure the belief was that the unions would have um, better capacity um, to organize the the public sector employees. The reality is, when we passed our paid family leave expansion. Um, almost immediately we started hearing from government employees saying you know hello what about us we also would like to have access to this and you know, which is fantastic because um it's really it means people are speaking up and one of the things that i have gone to and started conversations with are the um, public sector unions and saying okay you know let's figure this out together because there is a little bit of complexity to it um, but your members are coming to me and what i do is i send their members back to them um, so the unions are also hearing that from inside uh, that this is something that would be a great change uh, in our state and something that i would certainly would love to be able to see i think it would be a benefit to those employees and a benefit to the state overall 
Great, thank you. That really resonates with me. It was a similar experience in Boston, and we've had a few questions about uh, what happened at the city council level. We've, we've talked about different state efforts. So if I can just ask for your indulgence in spending two minutes on uh, how what we did in Boston and how that oh, came sure. to be. Uh, we, in uh, just about a month ago at this point, uh, had officially passed the paid parental leave ordinance that immediately offered six weeks of paid leave to city employees who are not covered by a collecting, collective bargaining agreement. Um, it's, it was a step down benefit. So 100% of your salary uh, could be taken for the first two weeks, 75% for weeks three and four, and then 50% for weeks five and six. Um, this was very difficult for me as someone who had just gone through the whole process of having a baby and realizing that your head is still spinning at weeks five and six. And um, obviously we want to do more. We, we need to do more. Uh, the, the difficulty was in trying to quantify the potential cost or, or even potential benefit of something that was, was fairly uncertain for the administration. How many people would take the benefit? What sorts of positions uh, would, would lead to what sorts of costs? Some might need to hire substitutes, some might not. Um, the process started for me in uh, about, about a year ago at this point when I was pregnant and trying to decide what I would do afterwards as, as the first city councilor to go through this. As I started asking around, I realized that other women in City Hall were simply using their sick days and vacation time. You know, when you give birth, you are, you are not sick and you're, you're certainly not on vacation. And um, <laughs> as someone who's new to the role, uh, I would not have had that time saved up anyway. Um, so it was important to set a stake in the ground and say, we're going to do something immediately for even that very small group of employees that we could impact. And then, um, as I believe Ellen was saying, make a new bottom line, shift the post, the goalpost out such that now every time bargaining comes up, the default is that paid parental leave should be part of the conversation. Uh, this I am so lucky to be working with an administration and a mayor who got it right away. And the question was just, how do we get it done rather than do we need this benefit? Uh, my colleagues voted unanimously to pass it. And uh, we introduced it in March of this past year, had hearings, dealt with some of the concerns around the implementation, and then it was signed into law last month. So very excited that at the city level we can we can keep pushing the momentum for more states to join on and, and um, hopefully the the federal government as well so that gets to a question from jenny uh, who asked what are some common arguments against paid leave and how can we respond to them uh, I, I faced a few but i would love to hear first from from gail as as you pushed it through in rhode island Yeah, I, <laughs> um, well, uh, <laughs> as, as pretty much with anything, when you're trying to change a, a, a workplace law, um, you will have pushback that we are trying to mandate business to do something um, and that we shouldn't mandate them. They should be able to do it on their own. Of course, if they were going to do it on their own, they already would have. So um, that's a, a kind of a false argument, um, you know, but the, ultimately there's just this overall belief that um, the sky will fall. It will uh, have a negative impact on the economy. Businesses will suffer and that, um, it, you know, employees will abuse it. And the reality is looking from both California's uh, research and uh, New Jersey, and uh, we have research that is, underway but un, unpublished at this point from Rhode Island, we know that that's simply not true. Um, you know, people use this time off. It allows them to keep money in their pockets and pay the bills and go back to work. And particularly in Rhode Island where that job is protected, know that they can go back to work um, and, and are happier for having been able to deal with the whatever stress in their life, even if it was the happy stress of a newborn baby. Um, as Michelle said, that isn't vacation. <laughs> and we all certainly know that everybody who's in the house with a small child. Uh, so, you know, they know that they can 
can return to work and and still have their job, and that's critically important. Um, so all of the arguments that are used against paid family leave are the arguments that have been used for any labor um, related policy that we've tried to change over the course of the hundred years or so. I made a quiz, I made a quiz if any of you wanted to uh, let me know. And it has statements like that, you know, the, if, if you pass this law, manufacturing will flee the state or business will end and tens of thousands of people will lose their jobs. And then I ask after each one who said this, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, NFIB, a conservative governor. And it turns out, of course, in each case, it's the first one is from the real estate president, the president of the real estate board in New York after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911, when the very first rudimentary protections were put in and that, you know what they were? That there had to be inspections, you had to have a fire escape and you couldn't lock the workers in while they were doing their job. This is what he said would create chaos. Likewise, ending child labor and the unpaid FMLA. So we have good answers to that. And the other thing that's really, like I said, talking about the cost of not doing it, and let's remember something. What we're proposing isn't just a minimum, it's minimal. When we look at what people have around the country, and these are very modest programs, but the good news is we have lots of evidence they have a track record, and they're really um, a, a strong case to say they're good for families, good for business, good for the economy, and good for public health. Absolutely, and so one of our, um our participants, Ellen, has asked for a copy of the quiz, so we'll, we'll have to make sure that gets in the materials as well. Uh, one other front that we faced in Boston is around this idea that you're creating a special class of people, that parents are choosing to have children, and, and why should they, through that choice, um, be able to take an extra benefit compared to the, their colleagues who may not be uh, so lucky to have children or, or choose to, to do that themselves. And it was very powerfully answered with the medical research from some pediatricians and, and others who uh, came and testified, really pointing to the disparities that the United States faces in infant mortality rates and uh, the public health outcomes that, that Ellen also mentioned. So let's take one step back and, and talk about the fact that paid leave is being talked about now. Uh, the question is, why is it that paid leave is such a hot topic in, in the country. It feels like over the past year or two, it's come to the forefront. And, and I would agree, I would say even in the last couple of months, uh, we've been hearing a lot more about paid leave, uh, both parental leave and, and uh, other types of paid leave. But is there something about this point in our country's um, social or, or economic history or, or um, women's participation? Why is it that now, now it's uh, much more in the conversation? Well, I'll take a first jump at that. We're winning because we're winning. And the more people see others who have won this, the more they both want it and realize that it's possible, that those were people just like them who made it happen and that they can make it happen too. I think it's really important to realize that voters, as you know, are not apathetic. They feel disenfranchised. They feel that money talks and no one listens to them. And when their voices are heard in some places, then people want their own voices heard in others. I want to get to the point, think about the culture change that's happened in this country around marriage equality, where Indiana was shamed for having a pizza joint that wouldn't serve same, you know, uh, gays and lesbians. Think about what happened when you have the son of one of the biggest segregationists saying it's shameful to have a symbol of slavery on his state capital. I want to get to the point where not being for family leave would be the thing that no one would dare say they are. And we have to be careful because some politicians are going to argue, of course, we're for family values. And that's why we support X, Y, and Z programs like comp time. And I'm going to write a blog and send it to you soon on what's wrong with a program that says you can have more time to spend with family only after you've been forced to spend more time away from your family working mandatory overtime. So we, we need to you know, show what really are these principles. But the truth is, parents need these and are beginning to realize that it's not a personal problem, it's systemic, and that there are common sense solutions and that they can help make them happen. And more candidates are realizing it's not just good policy, like Gail was saying, it's good politics, and we're getting more champions. 
I want to add that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ellen is also being modest and not uh, acknowledging the incredible amount of work that she has done for decades on the issue of paid family leave and paid sick days. And it is through, um, you know, brilliant strategic efforts by Family Values at Work and other organizations that have been able to really keep the momentum going on this. And um, I know Rhode Island kind of came out of left field. Nobody really thought we would be able to pull off such a momentous uh, win in such a short period of time. But it really helped um, other people reach out and recognize that they can, you know, to keep this going. And Ellen and Family Values at Work have done an incredible job um, making sure that that continues to stay, stay in the public um, eye and in public conversation as well as politicians talking about it. Great. Well, thank you so much. There are more questions and lots of interest, but unfortunately, our time is coming to a close. So thank you all for a wonderful conversation. Thank you especially to our two experts, uh, Ellen Bravo and Senator Gail Golden. You'll be hearing from Emerge America shortly. You'll, you'll receive an email with some of the follow-up materials, as well as an invitation to next month's webinar with Democratic pollster Celinda Lake. Um, so thank you all again for, for participating and look, looking forward to more wins to come. And let me just say that we're glad to hear from you. Feel free to email us, check out our Facebook pages and uh, the website, and there's lots of resources we can help you get from our own work and those of our partner groups. Thanks a lot.